There we go. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first uh, official program of 2022 for the McKeesport Regional History and Heritage Center. My name is David Moore. I am the museum director at the Heritage Center. Um, thank every. I want to thank everybody for uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, like I said, for our very first program of 2022, uh, our program tonight is presented by uh, Kimberly Hess on her new book, A Lesser Mortal: The Life of Sarah B. Cochran. Uh, so she's going to uh, talk through her book and uh, the story of Sarah here tonight. We'll have about a 45 minute or so uh, presentation from her, and then some time. Uh, for her to answer questions at the end. Um, I'm just gonna ask everybody from the word go to please make sure that you are muted. Uh, that way we don't have any interruptions. Uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, put them into the chat uh, at the bottom of your screen and we can, uh, we can ask Kimberly uh, at the end um, those questions. Um, and I think without further ado, Kimberly, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Dave. Let's see. I'm just trying to share. There we go. Can you see my slides this way? Yeah, you're good. Uh, it just, okay. uh, if you start the slideshow, that'll be. Okay. Good. Yep. Terrific. So this is um, Sarah B. Cochran's life um, in a quick overview. Um, I'm very appreciative to be here for International Women's Day. And I'm so happy that Sarah Cochran is the topic of conversation today of all days. Um, I'll spend a couple of minutes just talking about my connection to Sarah B. Cochran in Western Pennsylvania and why I wrote a book about Sarah. And I'll spend the bulk of the presentation talking about her life. Um, we'll have to move rather quickly through some of her accomplishments because of time constraints. So definitely if you have questions or want to talk in more detail about a particular area, I'm happy to take questions about that at the end. I'll end with some information about some of the research methods and resources that were particularly helpful in putting the book together and what are as opportunities for those of us who do genealogical research or are the family historians or local historians. So um, my family has been in Western Pennsylvania starting in the 1780s. And in 1969, my parents moved to New Jersey when my dad got a job teaching at a college there. So I was born and raised in New Jersey, but just about every month we would go to Western Pennsylvania to visit uh, my grandparents and extended family and friends. That was in the Fayette County area. So I would get to visit Linden Hall once in a while. When I was growing up, there were docent led tours of the mansion. This was a mansion that Sarah B. Cochran built in 1913, and that's the house that's pictured at the top right. Um, our family church on my dad's side of the family was the Philip G. Cochran Memorial United Methodist Church in Dawson, which is the photo on the bottom right. That's where I was baptized. My parents were married there. My grandparents were trustees and even my great grandparents were married in the parsonage there. So family weddings and Christmas Eve services were always there. And I grew up having a connection to places the Cochran built. I also knew that we were related to her. She was my great great grandmother's cousin and she put my great grandmother through college in the 1910s. So I was always very proud of the accomplishments that I knew Sarah had. When I took my husband to Western Pennsylvania for the first time in 2015, I was telling him about Sarah and I took him to see Linden Hall and the church. And he was kind of surprised because when he Googled Sarah's name, he couldn't find any information about her. And he suggested that I write a Wikipedia entry for her. And I liked that idea. So I did that in early 2017. And I started doing more research and started writing some guest blog posts for a couple of museum websites. And I did a StoryCorps recording about Sarah's philanthropy with Donna Edwards Jordan. 
and then a presentation to the Fayette County Historical Society. And this was by the end of 2018. And I was getting to a point where I had enough research done and I was getting enough questions together that could still be answered that the next logical step seemed to be a book. So Sarah Cochran's life was a life that she might not have expected to have in the era that she was living. And it was certainly a life I never expected to write about either. Um, so I, I decided I would spend um, 2019 focusing on more research, 2020 on writing, and 2021 on the publication and the start of the promotion. I'm not a trained historian. My background is in the corporate world. Um, I have experience working with organizations that have worked on women's advancement and education. So I brought what I knew from all of those different areas. And I was working on this while I was at home with my daughter. So uh, the goal for the book, which is right here, was to bring her story to a larger audience especially to people who are doing research on areas that might have touched Sarah's life, but also to give one example of what you can do as far as writing about a particular historical figure who might have been left out of the historical narrative and what I'm calling a lesser mortal, even though there's nothing actually lesser about that person. So let's talk about who Sarah Cochran was. She lived from 1857 to 1936, and she was born in a log house in Fayette County as Sarah Boyd Moore. And her family was rather poor. Um, her parents were farmers who most likely didn't own the farm where they worked. Um, and Sarah actually had to share clothes with one of her sisters in order to go to school every other day. Um, a lot of Sarah's life overlapped with the women's suffrage movement, the expansion of married women's property rights, and the expansion of Pennsylvania's coal industry. Now, Sarah isn't a person who left a huge paper trail. And maybe in having more people talking about her through the book and other projects, we'll find more information about her in the future. But for now, we don't have documents that really tell us what her thoughts were on things like the coal industry or the women's suffrage movement as she was growing up. But these were two areas in particular that would profoundly affect her life as an adult. Um, when she was a young woman, she became a maid in the home of Jim Cochran. And Jim Cochran may be a name that you haven't heard before. You've probably heard of one of his competitors, Henry Clay Frick. Jim Cochran was a generation older than Frick. And Jim was born in the 1820s. When he was a man in his 20s, he and a couple of family members mined their own coal, put it into beehive Coke ovens, and turned it into Coke. As the story goes, Jim built his own boat. He boated that Coke to Cincinnati, and he sold it to a man named Miles Greenwood. And this was the first time Connellsville Coke was ever sold for money. So this is considered the beginning of the Connellsville Coke industry that brought so much prosperity to Western Pennsylvania in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. So Jim is the person who is generally credited with pioneering this industry. Um, we know that he interacted with Frick. There's an interesting letter from Frick to Carnegie in the University of Pittsburgh's collections where Frick tells Carnegie that he intends to dominate the Connellsville Coke industry. And he goes on to describe what he thinks of a couple of his competitors. And one is Jim Cochran. And he says that Cochran is very vain. He's called the nester of the Coke industry. And he has six ignorant sons who all think they know something about Coke. Well, he was called the nester of the Coke industry because he pioneered it. And he did have several sons who he was bringing up to the family business. And the oldest was a man named Philip. Philip fell in love with Sarah Moore, the maid in the house. And they got married in September of, 19, uh, September of 1879. A year later, Sarah gave birth to their only child, James Philip Cochran. So we can probably assume that most of Sarah's life revolved around taking care of her son at this point. But 
it's been said that Philip brought Sarah into the coal business and taught her about the business. There are two deeds from 1883 that actually show Sarah and her mother-in-law, Clarissa Cochran, listed with their husbands for the sale of the Clinton and Franklin mines. And it's, it's absolutely clear in reading these deeds that these are not houses that are being sold. These are mines with mining equipment, some railroad tracks, some animals. This is a business endeavor. So it's very curious that both of the wives are listed on this deed in this place and time. In 1894, Jim Cochran died. So Philip became even more involved in the family business and he was running it for about five years. Um, he died when he was almost 50 in 1899 and his will left Sarah in full charge, care and control of the estate. So all of the businesses that he owned. No one else was listed on the will. There's no mention of his brothers or even his cousin, M.M. Cochran, who was a, a very accomplished attorney from Uniontown and who had been involved in setting up businesses and dissolving them. So from this, we could infer that he really saw his wife as having great business acumen and he didn't believe he was necessarily married to a spendthrift. He was tasking her with controlling this entire business with the intention of giving two thirds of it to their son in two years when their son would turn 21. The other third would be Sarah's indefinitely. So this seems easy enough to just shepherd the businesses along for two years. In March of 1901, six months before their son was supposed to turn 21, um, he was studying at the University of Pennsylvania, and by all accounts, he would have been a very healthy young man playing football. He had pledged Phi Kappa Psi as a fraternity, but he got a cold, and it turned into pneumonia. So in March of 1901, he suddenly died from that. And you can imagine where this would have left Sarah on a personal level. Her husband hadn't even been dead for two years. Now she's lost her only child. So the grieving process on its own must have been terrible in this case. But for her, she now has this entire business portfolio that she has to deal with. Again, we don't know what her thoughts were and whether she enjoyed being in business or whether she was looking forward to passing two thirds of this on to her son. But either way, she had a business portfolio that covered parts of Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia and Tennessee. It wasn't easy to be a woman in that particular industry at the time. Pennsylvania legally men from working in or around coal mines starting in the 1890s. And there were some miners who believed that a woman's presence near the coal mines would be bad luck. So if they were walking to work and a woman crossed their paths, they would turn around and go home because they thought they would be in an accident that day. So beyond just the, the issues of trying to be around a mine that you might own where work is being done, there were also traditions and sensibilities in other areas of the industry that would have created some obstacles for her to navigate. For example, in uh, December of 1904, one of the managers of the Washington Coal and Coke Company, which was her largest business in Pennsylvania, had a party called a smoker. And a smoker was a party that was only for men because as you can tell from the name, there would be smoking. And it was considered immoral for women to smoke in 1904. So the local newspaper covered this particular event. There was a band, there was a caterer. A number of men were invited from the railroad industry, the coal mining industry, the coking industry, and banking. And there was a list of all of the men who attended. And in among those names of all of these men from these industries is Sarah Cochran, who was there to provide pleasant entertainment and conversation with the host's daughters. So here she is at a party hosted by one of the managers of a company that she owns. And her presence has to be explained at that particular event. So this gives us an idea of what she was navigating and how hard it might have been. But regardless, she stayed in this industry into her 70s, in the 1930s. Um, 
I don't know why, if she believed that she owed this to her husband and her son, or if she just found that she enjoyed competing in business. Um, her businesses grew threefold under her leadership, so she did very well in spite of any obstacles that might have been there. In spite of all of the time that she spent in this industry and how well she was doing, a lot of times the business was really still considered her husband's. When she died in 1936, there was a three sentence obituary in a Pittsburgh newspaper that said that Philip Cochran was the businessman and Sarah Cochran was the philanthropist. And um, even in my family, I grew up hearing that Rick seemed to think that the business belonged to her husband, not to her. And that was always puzzling because her husband was dead for years by this point. And I think what we're seeing in both instances is the 19th century idea that, you know, a woman's place was in the home and a man's place was out in the world in business and politics and everything else. Um, and there might not have been an understanding as to why a woman would stick around in this business when she could just sell out and go home and you know enjoy her life. But even though she stayed for as long as she did, she's not still visible in public records at times. And this is a challenge um, for researchers who might be looking for women who are in the coal mining industry. This is a copy of the 1920 census, and as you can see, her occupation is shown as none, which doesn't really help us to see that there's a woman in the coal and coke industry um, doing productive labor. I checked the 1910 and the 1920 censuses just to see if there was something different in one of those, and essentially she's a blank space for an occupation in one, and she's the word employer in the other, which could mean a couple of different things. But that's something to keep in mind when you're looking at occupation information for women doing genealogical research or other historical research. So in addition to having this interesting business career, Sarah was a very effective philanthropist as well. So that three sentence obit in the Pittsburgh newspaper wasn't entirely wrong. She was very philanthropic. Um, according to a letter that she wrote to the Phi Kappa Psi West Virginia Alpha chapter, she got involved in philanthropy when she was grieving the loss of her husband and son. A young doctor apparently told her that she should think of all the schools and churches that she could aid, and she took that advice to heart. So she became a philanthropist who was active the rest of her life, um, often related to her Methodist faith, her family, and specific causes that really interested her. And it's, it's kind of powerful to see what she did because often her philanthropic activity wasn't just handing out you know, a, a turkey dinner to people. Um, sometimes what she was really doing was shifting power and doing things philanthropically that would allow people to make better lives for themselves and the people who would come after them. When she died in 1936, the dollar value of this philanthropy was estimated around $2 million for her, her public philanthropy or what has a paper trail associated with it and hundreds of thousands of dollars in what's considered more quiet philanthropy. So the philanthropy that's not always associated with a paper trail. If you convert it for inflation, it's over $43 million today. So you know she was making an impact locally. Okay. So these are some examples of her philanthropic activity. She was an educational philanthropist in a big way. Uh, she was the first female trustee of Allegheny College in Meadville. She was also a trustee at American University on the board with William Jennings Bryan, of all people, and Beaver College. And she endowed two academic chairs, one at Beaver and one at Bethany College. And one was in her name and one was in her mother-in-law's name. So she wasn't afraid to take credit publicly for certain things herself. Because her son had pledged Phi Kappa Psi at the University of Pennsylvania, she was a big benefactor of Phi Kappa Psi from the time he died until the time she died. In fact, a Phi Kappa Psi 
um, pin was one of the items that she willed to someone in her family or, or one of her friends um, in the 1930s. She became the mom of the West Virginia Alpha chapter in Morgantown. She contributed money toward um, building fraternity houses. She bought the West Virginia Alpha chapter, its fraternity house. And after she died, she became the namesake of that house, which seems ahead of its time and kind of unusual to have a fraternity house named for a woman. But there is a Sarah B. Cochran house in Morgantown, and that's our Sarah B. Cochran. She also built college dormitories. There were two of them, both called Cochran Hall. The one in the black and white photo is at Otterbein College, and it was there until the 1970s. There was a fire in the 70s, so the building itself is no longer standing. But this was a dormitory for women, and this was at a co-ed college. It was Phillips' alma mater and also Henry Clay Frick's alma mater. So she was doing something to help women um, at that college. And I don't know that we think about it as much today, but building a dormitory for women in the 19th and early 20th century sometimes just meant that it allowed the college to admit more female students. The color photo is Cochrane Hall at Allegheny College in Meadville. And this was the most expensive building on campus when it was built. It was designed by the same architect who designed the US immigration station at Ellis Island. And when she built this, the president of the college acknowledged her as well as Andrew Carnegie as being the as having the greatest impact on the college during this particular building campaign. And I think in this campaign, she actually donated a little more than Carnegie did. So you can get a sense of how she was more important than Carnegie in certain places, even though she didn't have the same level of wealth and the more global reach that he did. So some of her quieter educational philanthropy was putting people through college if they had promise and they were local people. And my great grandmother was one of those people. Um, this is a picture of her in her dorm room at um, the Pennsylvania State Normal School at Indiana, which is now part of IUP, and a picture of her around that time just in a, a, a posed portrait. I had also mentioned that some of her philanthropy was related to her Methodist faith, and she built three churches in Fayette County. Um, one was a brick church in Dawson, and this is an artist's rendering of it around 1902. She built this in 1900 to memorialize her husband, Philip. And then when she was traveling in Dresden in 1905, she bought a full-size copy of the Sistine Madonna from the estate of L. Storm, who was an, a German artist practicing in Dresden. And this is interesting because Storm had copied this painting um, from the original in Dresden because Jane Stanford uh, coordinated this purchase of a, a copy. Um, Jane Stanford was putting together the museum at Stanford University at the time, and she felt that people in California wouldn't be able to travel to Europe in the 1890s to see Renaissance masterpieces. So she wanted to bring copies of them to California. So a newspaper actually reported that Andrew Carnegie tried to buy this other copy and the artist refused to sell it to him for whatever reason. By 1905, when Sarah was visiting Dresden, the artist was dead. Sarah was, be, was able to get it for a thousand or two thousand dollars and she sent it home to Dawson to have it hung in the church. So one of the local papers in Connellsville made the particular comment of Mrs. Cochran has succeeded where Mr. Carnegie failed and almost seemed to delight in the fact that they had something that Carnegie wasn't able to buy himself. So this church also had a beautiful Tiffany window in it. Um, and I'll just show you, a, a, this is a picture of Dawson in 1902. This is where the artist's rendering of the church is from. Dawson was a railroad town and it had been growing over 
a few decades with the growth of the railroads in Pennsylvania. So it's not really a place where you would expect to find a full scale copy of a Renaissance masterpiece. It's also not a place where you would expect to find a Gothic revival church of this size. And this is the church that she built 25 years later in Dawson to replace the brick church that we just looked at. This one is also the Philip G. Cochran Memorial Church, but it's to memorialize her husband and her son. It was designed by Thomas Pringle. Henry Hunt did the stained glass windows for it. It's now on the uh, National Register of Historic Places for Architectural Significance. And the, the copy of the Sistine Madonna was moved into it. And the original Tiffany window from the brick church was moved in there as well. So beyond her religion and her family, one of the issues that mattered to Sarah was suffrage. Um, we don't know exactly why she supported suffrage. There were certainly different reasons why she might have, um, but she did become involved with it through the local suffrage organizations in Fayette County. And in 1915, as you may know, Pennsylvania had a referendum on women's suffrage. And it was so important that there were um, fundraising events kind of popping up all over the state. And they were so important that Anna Howard Shaw went from event to event giving free speeches to try to win over voters. Sarah opened up her home, Linden Hall, to host one of these events. And it was the largest, largest event in Western Pennsylvania ahead of this referendum. And it's interesting to look at the publicity that the event got and how Linden Hall was used and what was happening at the event too. On the left, you can see almost a full page of newspaper uh, articles and advertising about the event with the headline of beautiful Linden Hall's influence for votes for women. In addition to seeing um, some text about Linden Hall, there's also an exterior shot of the house, there's an interior shot, there's a photo of Sarah Cochran. Um, this is almost like what we would see on Instagram today before an event takes place to kind of build our interest and convince us to spend the money for admission. And in this case, admission was a dollar per person for three hours of events. Um, it ended up being very well attended, according to newspapers. Some newspapers estimated 500 people attended, others estimated that 600 people attended. Either way, that's pretty good attendance. Um, the event wasn't one of those suffrage events that would have had kind of brash ways of engaging with people. No one was lighting an effigy of a politician on fire to make a point. Um, this was a much more sedate event, more on the elegant side. Uh, Sarah had opera singers, um, female opera singers, singing arias from Aida and Thais on the grounds of Linden Hall. Um, when they had their meeting where Anna Howard Shaw was speaking, they called it to order using a potato masher as a gavel. And that seems kind of absurd when we hear about it today. But if you think about it, it makes sense for the time. The newspaper covering the event at the time said or quoted the person starting the meeting as saying that this was to prove that enfranchised women could still be domestic. Now, if you think back two years ago, Judy Sutton did a presentation for Mickey's Port about cookbooks being used as suffrage fundraising items. That was for the same reason that there really was a concern that if women got the vote, they would get out of the kitchen and that would be the end of life as everyone knew it. So that's how it manifested itself at this particular event at Linden Hall. Um, so once the meeting was called to order, Anna Howard Shaw spoke, um, that was the end of the meeting. Anna Howard Shaw was off to, I think, Northwestern Pennsylvania the next morning to give another speech. There was coverage in, Pittsburgh papers about the event, and this is an interesting one to look at, that uh, was the Pittsburgh Daily Post on July 30th, and it shows Sarah Cochran in profile in what I think is a beautiful image of her. This to me is a visual refutation of any anti-suffragists 
arguments saying that suffragists were you know, emotional, man-hating, shrewish, anything negative, because this is such a dignified looking person. This is an image that you could print on money if you were um, a monarch or a head of state. She really, as the farmer's daughter, as the new woman, the businesswoman, has as much dignity as George Washington does here. So that's a very interesting image to have chosen in 1915. So what is Sarah B. Cochran's legacy now that we've talked about some of the accomplishments from her life? Well, certainly she affected the built environment in Western Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia. But she also provides a very different image of the early 20th century's mining industry in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia, Tennessee. She's an alternative authority figure in the business world in the early 20th century. And I think she's an important example of more of women's accomplishments from this era. So certainly someone who is studying women's history, business, any of these different subjects that we've talked about uh, could definitely find a whole case study of information in Sarah's life. She also left a, an important educational legacy when she started educating people in her community because she wasn't just providing education for those people and adding to what her community had. She was also creating a situation where those people might now expect to provide more education for their children and there would be more of a ripple effect. So this was very interesting as a legacy um, for people who stayed in Western Pennsylvania and even for those who moved on to other parts of the country years later. And last, I think, you know, her story is very, very specific in some ways. She is a particular person in a very specific industry and place and time involved in specific causes and even religious denominations but there's a universality to it. Um, she's an outsider in some ways. She's the first and only to do certain jobs or have certain roles. And she prevails when other people believe that she has no business doing what she's doing. She also you know, became philanthropically active um, many times because she believed in a cause and wasn't necessarily uh, supporting a cause for public relations benefit. So, you know, this meant that it was harder for her name to get out more broadly compared to some people who were philanthropic in that era. Um, but I think it also relates her to, to people today who are very philanthropic in their communities and aren't looking to make a name for themselves everywhere. So that's what I see in her legacy when I think of it. Um, I want to end with some discussion of some of the research methods and resources that I used that might be helpful to other people. Um, I know we've all thought of wills and deeds and letters and items like that. Um, so I was trying to think of some other areas that might be helpful that really jumped out in all of the research from this book because there was a lot of research in it. From historic preservation, I found that the Historic American Buildings Survey and the Historic American Engineering Record provided a great deal of detail about specific towns and buildings. Um, sometimes you can even find references at, of other sources um, and source material when you look through these. Um, I definitely checked the National Register of Historic Places applications for Linden Hall and um, the Cochrane Church in Dawson. Those are wonderful because they give you context for the building that's being discussed. They can give you details like photos of it, um, floor plans, and other reference materials that were used when the application was put together. So there are all different levels of detail that you can find in those. I had mentioned at the beginning that I'm not a trained historian, so I brought what I knew from my undergraduate experience and a corporate career to the way that I analyzed the coal and coke industry. I wanted to learn about the coal and coke industry and how it created wealth for Sarah so that I could explain that to a reader because there are already books all about the coal and coke industries. So um, 
I had studied economics in college and my specialization was industrial organization. So I found myself going back to the industrial organization paradigm, which is just structure, conduct, performance, and public policy. And if you use those as guideposts, you can essentially hit the different areas that you need to do a, a quicker analysis of a particular industry. And I found myself reading the Pennsylvania reports of the Department of Mines from about 1870 until 1930, which is, you know, you don't have to read the entire report for each year because each report is about 800 to 1,000 pages, but you can go through and find the overview of what's happening in the industry each year to see how it's evolving. You can get statistics on particular mines and businesses and, and information about how each one's operating. And then last, I tried to use what I knew of different larger movements and cultural changes um, to find resources that would um, help me to analyze Sarah's context that she operated in. So the women's suffrage movement and women philanthropists of the early 20th century were two areas where I had done some reading and had been um, involved with organizations previously. So I, I had some resources available through those um, and was able to learn a little more and, and bring some context to life for Sarah through that and understand more about what era she was living in. Typically, I think any genealogist knows the fan approach of friends and neighbors and researching those. And in most cases, you know, I looked at some friends and neighbors, but it also made sense to look at some of the bigger names who were in her orbit, people who might have left more of a paper trail than Sarah did. For example, Ida Tarbell was an alumna representative to the Allegheny College Board of Trustees when Sarah was on that board. And Ida Tarbell has papers that are on file at Allegheny College and Smith College's archives. She also wrote a memoir. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem that she saved any correspondence from Sarah Cochran if the two ever wrote to each other. But her memoir was extremely important for me because she explained what it was like to grow up in Western Pennsylvania at the same time Sarah did. They were only a few months apart in age. They were both born in log houses, one in Northwestern Pennsylvania, one in Southwestern Pennsylvania. And Ida was from a, a different socioeconomic background than Sarah, but it gave an idea of what the limits or upper limits of, of lifestyle might have been at that time. Um, certainly, Anna Howard Shaw has a number of papers. I was able to get her diary online from the Schlesinger Library. Phi Kappa Psi's West Virginia Alpha Chapter had a great deal of information. Um, David Woodrum's history of that chapter was great because it reprinted a letter that Sarah wrote to the chapter in 1935. And in it, she explained why she got into philanthropy, um, her thoughts on motherhood, what books she was reading, what she was listening to on the radio. It was just a treasure trove of information. And it's the kind of thing you really hope you can find, but you don't always get that lucky. Um, Sarah had interactions with Methodist bishops, not just through the boards of Methodist affiliated colleges where she was a trustee, but also because she opened Linden Hall up to the Methodist bishops of the world for 10 days in 1916 so that they could host their semi-annual meeting in her home. So looking at some of their um, archives was helpful as well. I think when we do genealogy, we look at government records quite a bit and who hasn't looked at the census. I found myself going back to the census just to look at her occupation information um, after reading a book by Robert Lepresti called When Women Didn't Count. And his book is about how certain biases about women in the early 20th century and late 19th century affected the way that information was collected in the census and some other records. And it was eye-opening. So I would suggest that book if you do any kind of research that involves women's occupations in the census. Before looking at, into writing this book, I had never had a reason to use the US non-population census. And now I think I would use it again. Um, 
it was interesting to me because I wanted to find out more about what a farm family would have been like in Fayette County in the 19th century. And the non-population census was a great way to get information as a snapshot of what farms looked like in the 1860s, 1870s, and so forth. You can look up a particular county and then a person's name and find out how many acres that person owned and what kinds of livestock the person had and what crops they were harvesting each year. And then you can see what their neighbors were doing too and get a sense of what the largest and the smallest types of operations were and where your relative fit in. So I would recommend that as well. Family documents are obviously a great source of information and even of clues for a lot of research. And for me, they opened my eyes um, to what we as genealogists and family historians might be able to contribute to larger museums and archives so that obscure people from history are more discoverable to people doing academic research and other research. I had shown you these two photographs earlier. In the course of doing the research for the book, I actually donated digital copies of these to IUP's archive so that they have some images of women's life in college in the 1910s. Um, we happen to have the paper program from the semi-annual meeting of the bishops at Linden Hall. Um, this was just in a file cabinet in my family. And it was interesting because it shows you a picture of the brick church in Dawson. It also gives you a list of all of the bishops who went to this meeting or were invited. We also had the original dedication services program from 1927 for the Gothic Revival Church in Dawson. And this was many pages, um, but this just shows you the cover and the photograph of Sarah Cochran that was included in it, which is really more valuable than you would think because there just aren't that many pictures of Sarah Cochran. Um, I had talked with a relative who told me he grew up in Dawson and never saw Sarah's picture until he read my book. So this is a valuable resource to have. And there's also a picture of the church and the minister who was at the church at the time. Um, I donated this document and the bishop's document to the Methodist archives at Drew University and sent digital copies out to a number of different archives and museums that might have an interest as well. Because there's just all kinds of, of information that could be valuable to other researchers. So I'll end with this particular document. It is a document that I came across by accident about 12 years ago when my dad and I were going through papers in my grandparents' house. This is the Pennsylvania State Sabbath School Association diploma presented to my great grandmother, the same one I had mentioned earlier in 1914. I saved it because it was an interesting memento of my great grandmother. The, um, the font and the flourishes are beautiful on it. Um, I kept it with all of my genealogical documentation that I have and didn't think anything else about it for years until I started working on this project. I was trying to find out if there was any way that H.J. Hines and Sarah Cochran might have known each other socially or professionally. And I got my hands on a biography of Hines. And in that biography, it explained that he was in a leadership position for the Pennsylvania State Sabbath School Association. And when I read that, I thought, I think that's the document I have in the closet. Let me check. And I did. And sure enough, there's his signature as the president in 1914. So this alone doesn't really help us with anything, but it did get me thinking that if my great grandmother was getting this diploma from this organization that Heinz was leading, maybe Sarah Cochran was involved with the organization as well. The records for this organization are at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. I contacted them, they checked their records, and they didn't find Sarah in a leadership position. All the leadership roles no surprise were men at the time, but they did find out that Sarah was a sponsor of the World Sunday School Exposition in Rome in 1907, and this sent over a thousand delegates to the Colosseum and to other events 
in Rome. We don't know if Sarah attended or not, but this filled out another part of her philanthropy that I had never heard of. And it's just because I happened to have this document um, in my house. So it's a great example, I think, of how we end up with documents and artifacts for people that wouldn't necessarily matter to historians who are researching the big names in history, but we have information that can be of great help in research. So, you know, what I've learned from writing this book is you know, the obvious, you can't find what's not there. If there's not information in an archive or a museum about someone, then researchers who don't know about that person won't be able to find out about them. We need to put information there ourselves when possible. So I would just suggest that we all think about what we might be able to donate, um, whether it's original documents or digital copies, um, to help fill out the representation, especially of women um, in collections of archives and museums. So that's as much as I have. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has them. Go ahead, Katie. Um, I was wondering, Kimberly, uh, what surprised you the most in your research for this book? Oh, let's see. I think just the fact that it became clear that Sarah was someone who felt completely comfortable being among men. You know, she was in an industry that was male dominated. She was working with a fraternity. So she was constantly around men in that area. She wasn't someone who necessarily um, went off and only worked with women. She was able to get out and, and work with men, whether that was in her profession or somewhere else. And I hadn't really thought about that. I think maybe I would have assumed that life would have been more segregated by gender at, at that time. Any other questions? I do. Um, Kimberly, do you know, can you still tour Dawson? Can you still Tour Linden Hall? I think before COVID, they were doing more docent led tours. I don't know where things are now. Because didn't some union buy that facility? Yeah, the steelworkers bought it years ago. So there's, um, there's a golf course there. I think there was a motel there and a conference center for the steelworkers. And I know weddings have been hosted there. Yeah. Any other questions? I'll ask another one. Um, Kimberly, what was the hardest, the hardest part of your process? Um, trying to find the business information about her because there was so much that I couldn't find. I, I would have liked to have known how much agency she had in business. Um, and so much of that is information that you can only find through letters and journals and diaries, and that just doesn't seem to be available. And then getting my arms around how many businesses she actually owned and when she owned particular businesses was really tedious. Um, I had to limit my research to Pennsylvania just because I don't have research assistants to help with all of this. So I feel like I don't have a good grasp of how big the business was outside of Pennsylvania. And then within Pennsylvania, I always have this fear, there's probably another business that she owned that I wasn't able to find because it's just hard to associate the business with its actual owner for the way that records were kept. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Oh. Jennifer, you're, you're on mute. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, do you have a sense that she went to work every day at the Coke factories or what? 
I'm not sure that she did. I don't have any information that specifically says what a day was like for her. That's what I wish I could have found. Right. Um, and I don't know if once she built Linden Hall, if she was just working there because she had the space to work there. In some cases, some of the mining companies' offices were listed in Dawson. So I'm not sure how much management was at the facility every day. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how welcome she would have been in the facilities either, given the sensibilities. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering, because my, yeah. my grandfather had coal mines and he went to them every day. And I yeah. Was, uh, yeah, curious about that. Thank and you. that's where I think, you know, she wouldn't have been an exact duplicate for Philip Cochran in this case, because Philip grew up in the industry. He had been a mine superintendent. He could have gone in the hole if he wanted to. But Sarah didn't have any of that background. And certainly right. she wasn't supposed to be going in the hole with with the miners. So it must have been odd from their standpoint to think that, you know, they went from someone who had all of this experience to someone who didn't and wasn't part of the culture and couldn't be a part of it. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody, anybody else with any questions for Kimberly? Well, I have one big question. How do people get a hold of your book? <laughs> Okay, well, it's available on Amazon and it's available through the Ingram distribution network. So um, basically anywhere else. I know I've seen it in Barnes and Noble and Target's websites. Um, any independent bookseller should be able to order it for you. Okay, great. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, uh, if anybody has any last questions, now would be the time. Otherwise, uh, Kimberly, thank you for your, your presentation. It was uh, very, very interesting. And we really appreciate you taking the time to uh, share Sarah's story with us. And congratulations on the book. And hopefully it's, uh, it's a big success for you. Thank you. Uh, and we appreciate you taking the time again tonight. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending our, uh, our, our first program of 2022. Uh, again, you know, we always appreciate any support. Uh, from our from our patrons, whether that's virtually or at the Heritage Center. Uh, just uh, looking ahead, we have a lot of stuff on our radar for the next couple of weeks. Um, our next program is, uh, this has actually changed from the original date. Uh, it is now going to be on Wednesday, March 30th at the Heritage Center at, uh, at six o'clock. It is the Trash Treasures and the Mon uh, Monongahela Resilience Program hosted by Allegheny Cleanways, uh, which is going to focus on um, a pretty actually interesting topic. This organization um, basically is trying to save history uh, by uh, going into these, uh, these, these houses that are being torn down and, and, and stuff being thrown out and trying to preserve history before it ends up in a, uh, in a landfill somewhere. So that program should be pretty interesting. That is gonna be Wednesday, March 30th at 6 p.m. at the Heritage Center. On Saturday, uh, April 2nd at 11 a.m., we're gonna have our very first yoga class at the Heritage Center. Uh, it's gonna be hosted by, uh, it's called Yoga with Ralph. Uh, Ralph is a local McKees porter who's gonna be offering uh, up a, a, a yoga class for anybody who's interested. Uh, if you are interested, you do have to register on our website. Uh, there, there's links to that there uh, because there are only so much, so much space for you to, um, for us to host that. Uh, our next program is April 7th. That's a Thursday at 6.30 p.m. Uh, it is called Steel Boats and Iron Men, a presentation on Cold War submariners by Bob McPherson. If anybody was at our December program on Pearl Harbor, you know, uh, what a good speaker Bob is. So that's certainly one you don't want to miss. And then on Thursday, April 21st at 6.30 p.m., we are going to have another Zoom presentation. Um, this one is uh, entitled History of the Negro Leagues in the, Mo in the Mon Valley uh, and is presented by Samuel Black of the Heinz History Center. So um, unfortunately, we weren't able to have a Black History Month program at the center this year, um, but uh, mostly because of scheduling issues, 
Uh, but Sam was uh, gracious enough to do this program for us in April, which fits right in, hopefully, with the start of baseball season if this lockout ever ends. So uh, we have a lot of great programs coming up. If you're interested uh, with, about more details about these programs, you can visit our website, uh, www.mckeesportheritage.org, and look on the events page. Uh, we have some other stuff coming down the pipe for May and June, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, if you don't subscribe to our e-newsletter, please uh, see that you do that on our website, and uh, we go from there. Uh, yes, yeah, Sarah. The event you said was on April 21st. What time was that? Uh, it's going to be 6.30, and it's a Zoom program, so you can register for it on the website, um, and you can view it from anywhere. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so I think that's it, everybody. Once again, thank you, Kimberly, for your time and, and your wonderful presentation. Good luck uh, with your book. Uh, thank you to everybody for tuning in and, and joining us this evening. We'll see you in a couple of weeks at the Heritage Center. So thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye.